Hi, I'm Laurie Couture, and the subject of my presentation is going to be Developmental Trauma, the Root of Suicidality and Behavioral, Emotional, and Learning Problems in Boys and Young Men. I have no uh, financial relationships to disclose. On September 27, 2017, every parent's worst nightmare struck my family. My 23-year-old son Bryson went missing, and a week later, his body was found. Bryson had taken his life. I adopted Bryson at the age of 11 from the foster care system. Bryson lived in at least two residential facilities and up to 13 different foster and respite homes. A brilliant, quirky, loving, and adventurous, and creative boy, Bryson suffered limbic system shattering traumas at the hands of his birth family and of a foster care system that couldn't meet his needs. This included both legal traumas, illegal traumas such as child abuse and neglect, and legal traumas that we will be discussing in this presentation. I'm here today as both a parent and a professional to sound the alarm that we must address and remedy the silent pain of our boys and young men and the neglect that they have been enduring in our medical, mental health, educational, legal, and human service fields. A brilliant mind like Bryson's had so much to offer to society, but he felt that there was no place for him in society. Perhaps the 35,000 other males who ended their life also in 2017 felt the same way. But what would cause a boy or a young man to feel this way, that there's no place for him in society? Developmental trauma. Developmental trauma suffered in childhood, including in adolescence, is at the root of suicidality and behavioral, emotional, and learning problems in boys and young men. This is very different from what we often hear in our media or from our professional development or from our society's institutions about the causes of young male behavioral issues. We often hear that the problems young males exhibit are inherent to their maleness, often that the problems are behavioral rather than as a result of distress or trauma, or that males are inherently violent rather than victims of childhood violence, or that it's this to testosterone rather than high levels of cortisol. Sometimes we're told that they weren't taught respect <coughs> as children rather than they weren't treated with respect in childhood. A popular one now we hear is that it's a result of toxic masculinity rather than a toxic childhood. However, neuroscience, neuroscience supports the trauma-based cause. Let's refresh our understanding of trauma. Trauma is an individual phenomenon. It's emotional injury that results when an individual feels powerless to cope with intense or chronic distress. When a boy is not soothed when he's distressed, the limbic system can become triggered, which triggers high cortisol levels, which then triggers a fight, flight, or freeze reaction. If this is unsoothed, then it can lead to dissociation. This cycle of emotional injury is what causes trauma. Trauma includes professionally recognized traumas such as child abuse and neglect, loss, abandonment by a parent, alienation of one parent by another, bullying and community violence, and exposure to sexually explicit and violent media. However, there are many legal practices in our society that raise cortisol levels and cause children, especially boys, to feel powerless and unable to cope with the distress. These include developmentally harmful but legal parenting practices, developmentally inappropriate but legal educational practices, and trauma-promoting practices in our society's institutions. These practices also harm the parent-son attachment relationship. The attachment cycle applies to children of all ages, not just infants and toddlers, but children all the way through late adolescence. The child has a need, the child expresses his need, and the parent meets the need as soon as possible and with sensitivity. If that happens, then the child feels homeostasis, which is a feeling that all systems inside or out are good. This leads to feelings of joy, trust, safety, and calm, which then leads to what's called secure attachment. However, most boys in our society have a very different experience. 
They have a need, they express the need, but often the parent delays or fails to meet the need. Then he is no longer feeling homeostasis, he is feeling distress. Distress is an alarm state, which then leads to emotions of anxiety, fear, mistrust, unsafety, anger, rage, and depression. And this is what leads to insecure or disrupted attachment. Most boys and young men are functioning with a disrupted attachment blueprint. Why is this so important for us to understand? Because attachment disruption is trauma. The crucial role of attachment in boys' behavioral and mental health is, is, gets very little attention in our fields. The best research comes not from our fields, but from the fields of cultural anthropology. James W. Prescott, Margaret Mead, Mary Ainsworth, Ashley Montague, and James DeMeo studied the contrast between parenting and educational practices in agricultural and industrialized cultures versus peaceful hunter-gatherer cultures. And they also studied the subsequent levels of mental illness and violence in those societies. And what they found was striking. They found that most of the parenting and educational practices in hunter-gatherer cultures promoted secure attachment, whereas, in contrast, most of the parenting and educational practices in industrialized and agricultural cultures resulted in attachment disruption. For example, in hunter-gatherer cultures, we found high levels of nurturing, uh, get, uh, nurturing children, intergenerational families, high degrees of skin-to-skin -skin contact, breastfeeding for at least two and a half and up to six years of age, no genital mutilation, including of males, no punishment of children, including no physical punishment, high levels of play and freedom, high, uh, natural learning, no schooling, and no early parent-child separation, as well as co-sleeping was common. And as a result, in these tribes, there's low levels of child abuse, low levels of child behavioral problems, low levels of mental illness, and low levels of social violence. In contrast, in agricultural and in industrialized cultures, we see low levels of nurturance towards children, split or broken families, low levels of skin-to-skin -skin nurturance, low levels of breastfeeding, lots of bottle feeding, breastfeeding for less than two and a half years, if at all, crib sleeping, genital mutilation of boys, high levels of punishment, including corporal punishment, forced schooling, forced work, low levels of play and freedom, and high levels of early childhood separation with parents. As a result, in these cultures, there's high degrees of child abuse and neglect, high levels of child behavioral problems, high levels of mental illness, and high levels of violence in our society. Excuse me. The researchers also found that boys are more likely than girls to suffer from parenting and educational practices that disrupt attachment and promote trauma. What are some of these legal but traumatic practices? Well, traumatic parenting practices include male genital mutilation. This is highly, or what we call circumcision, raises cortisol levels extremely high, causes high levels of distress in baby boys. Physical punishment, or what we call spanking, also jacks up cortisol levels and causes intense distress. Lack of skin-to-skin -skin and emotional nurturance. Punitive, permissive, or helicopter parenting is, are traumatic. Emotional withdrawal from sons, especially by mothers, or alienating dad from his son. And then early separation due to daycare and school. There are also traumatic educational practices, such as early separation of that parent and child dyad. Biological needs are delayed or denied in school. Children are not allowed to go to the bathroom when they need to. They're not allowed to eat when they're hungry or drink when they're thirsty. They can't move their bodies, and they can't get fresh air. Schools are punitive. They're, the learning is forced and not child-led. And there's a lack of play, movement, and sensory stimulation whereas most boys are kinesthetic learners and play is the very means by which children learn. There are also traumatic mental health practices, such as failing to see the symptoms of the child, a young adult, as alarm signals. 
reflexive psychotropic medicating of boys and young men, and ignoring the family and school causes of their behavior. Ignoring attachment disruption and trauma as causes of behavior. And another issue is most mental health professionals are untrained in the trauma attachment model. They're trained in the biological model. They also diagnose by the DSM-5 category rather than, again, the trauma and attachment model. There are medical practices that promote trauma, such as, again, circumcision, male genital mutilation, the removal of healthy, functional parts of the most intimate, private organ of a boy's body, ignoring the severity of screen use in boys and behavioral addictions to video games, ignoring the role of diet in behavior and health. For example, refined sugar, grains, and dairy are as addicting as cocaine. Soy, which is an endocrine disruptor, can not only make boys feel mes less masculine, but can actually cause mood instability. Also, in the medical field, there's very little advocacy for boys' uh, developmental needs for touch and nurturance, play, movement and physical activity, nature, sensory stimulation, and their biological homeostasis, especially at places like school. Also, we tend to ignore in this field trauma's effect on the body, behavior, and health. We have, tra we have trauma promoting public policy practices. Unfortunately, in our institutions, Violence against males is virtually ignored. Again, that male genital mutilation piece, sexual assault and rape is ignored, and dating and partner violence. We have biased methods used to collect and formulate statistics. Crime and hospital statistics are often used to determine who is a victim of sexual and domestic violence when studies show that male victims are not likely to report to these entities. <clears throat> Male victims and female perpetrators are often omitted from these studies. In fact, the FBI did not even include male victims of rape in their rape definition until 2012. Similarly, female victims and male perpetrators tend to be the focus of these studies. And also in a lot of these studies, loaded language is used that's not sensitive to male participants, such as, were you raped? Also, in actual empirical studies, highlights are pulled for the, for the media that tend to support the stereotype rather than what the raw data actually showed. Another issue is we have seven government offices for women and girls, and none for men and boys. There is no comparable andrology and men's health focus. It's very small. And female empowerment in our culture is to the exclusion of male empowerment. And lastly, we have trauma-promoting laws and legal practices. Again, it is legal to do to a boy's, it is legal to do to a boy's genitals what it is illegal to do to a girl's. Also, corporal punishment's legal, which the majority of the victims are male. Lack of rights for fathers. Also, male Male victims of sexual and domestic violence receive weaker justice than female victims, and male defendants of sexual and domestic violence receive harsher punishments than female defendants who sometimes receive no justice whatsoever. Why is this so important? Because developmental trauma, whether it's legal or illegal, harms boys and young men on every holistic level, epigenetic, neurological, physical, psychological, behavioral, social, sexual, morally, and ethically. Young male symptoms of trauma and acting out tend to be more outward, more, more behavioral, such as acting out behaviors, hyperactivity, anger and rage, defiance, withdrawal and apathy, alexithymia, stoicism or acting kind of swaggery, behavioral addictions to video games, chemical addictions, and emotional, physical, and sexual violence. Concerningly, young male ways of expressing distress, pain, and trauma tend to be overlooked, punished, or misunderstood by our society. How are, how are distressed males handled by our society? Well, they're stereotyped and shamed. They're punished and controlled. 
They're labeled and incorrectly diagnosed with collections of trauma symptoms that we call ADHD, oppositional defiant disorder, and conduct disorder. They tend to be put more through the legal system than the mental health system, and they're neglected by the human service institution. They're also omitted frequently from social justice and human rights efforts. Fellow professionals, we must do better to understand and meet the developmental needs of boys and young men. What do boys and young men need from us as professionals and from our society's institutions? Well, they need nurturance. They need protection. They need understanding and compassion. They need developmentally appropriate practices. They need male-sensitive interventions. And they need empowerment, just like our girls and young women need. If my son, who you see pictured here, is his absolute happiest, had received this outside of home, he'd probably be standing here next to me speaking to you. What happens if we continue to fail to meet the needs of boys and young men? Well, we will continue to see educational failure, behavioral and substance addictions. Boys and young men are failing at all levels of education, all races from preschool to graduate school. We will continue to see the failure to launch that's so common in our millennial young men and high rates of violence, suicide, and homicide. Empirical victim report studies show that males of all races are the primary victims of suicide. 80% of suicide victims are male, 80%. They are also the primary victims of homicide, child abuse, community violence, and parenting discrimination. And contrary to what we're often told in our professional development, boys and young men are, boys and men are the equal victims of sexual and partner abuse, sexual assault and rape, and one study in New York found that 50% of youth sex trafficking victims were male. We need to abolish discriminatory practices such as the ones we've already discussed, plus sexual and domestic violence programs that typecast males as predators and females as victims, or ideologies that view masculinity as toxic and femininity as benevolent, campaigns that empower only women and girls and omit boys and young men, and we must change the legal system's treatment of fathers. What are some interventions that we can do as professionals? Well, we can work to strengthen parent-son attachments. Boy-friendly alternative education, such as homeschooling, nature-based education, play-based education, hands-on education. We can refer for brain-based trauma treatments, such as eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, or EMDR, um, or neurofeedback. We can refer for attachment-focused family therapy, such as dyadic developmental psychotherapy or TheraPlay. We can abolish institutional discrimination against boys and young men. We can raise awareness about male victims of sexual and dating violence. We can raise awareness and push for public health campaigns that focus on male needs and fight for social justice efforts that focus on the inequality suffered by males. And most crucially, Suicide prevention must begin with trauma prevention. I'm Laurie A. Couture, author of Instead of Medicating and Punishing, and the upcoming book, Nurturing and Empowering Our Sons. Thank you very much. You can learn more at laurieacouture.com. Thank you.